St. Patrick's Day, leprechauns and dogman, as told to Peter Bernard, read by P.Q. River. I recently learned from my grandson that Rheingold beer is back in business and popular among the kids in his hipster Brooklyn neighborhood. I started to tell him a story about a St. Patrick's Day from long ago before Rheingold was hip when it was brewed in Bushwick, Brooklyn. My grandson rolled his eyes and pretended to be getting a phone call so that he didn't hear my story, the little twerp. If only he'd listened just one sentence more, he'd have found out that this isn't just any old man's story about beer and St. Patrick's Day. No, this is a story about beer, St. Patrick's Day, and Dog Man. <laughs> Sure, you'll be asking me what Dog Man has to do with St. Patrick's Day, and you'll be wondering if perhaps I might have meant leprechauns instead of the Dog Man. But don't you worry, this story has some leprechauns in it too, at least according to my buddy Seamus. Let me start at the beginning. Okay, it was 1969, because the Mets had just no, wait a minute, the Mets had just won the World Series, and this was March. So it must have been March of 1970. My boss and some more prestigious co-workers were planning a big bash for St. Patrick's Day up in the northern part of New York State. I'd never been up there before, as I'd heard it was all Yankee fans living in those parts, and it probably wouldn't be safe for someone like me to visit. It's not so much like this anymore. But in those days, we former Brooklyn Dodgers fans felt an obligation to root for the Mets as the inheritor of the mantle of the underdog team in New York City. They were marketed as being the team for the regular working man, and the beer that sponsored the Mets was the locally brewed Rheingold beer. My beer in those days truly was Rheingold beer. So much so that I got a job at their plant in Bushwick and had been working there for 10 years. I was pretty friendly with some of the higher-ups since I'd been there so long. One of them is the guy who donated his home for the party, a really upscale mansion designed for entertaining. My boss told me that me and Seamus could get in if we drove the beer truck there from Brooklyn. The party was up near Buffalo, so that's a seven-hour drive each way if the traffic gods are merciful. We certainly would be earning our invitations. Okay, so this was 1969, I mean 1970. We thought of ourselves as very sophisticated at the time, but looking back on it, there are some ways in which we were kind of primitive. For one thing, we were only beginning to realize how dumb it was to drive a motor vehicle while intoxicated. Actually, I'm not going to blame the times, and I definitely don't want anyone to think that's the way my co-workers would act. But Seamus and I were idiots. We were drinking from the truck on the trip up, and our reasoning was that we only drank while the other guy drove. Since we traded places every 90 minutes or so, this brilliant plan meant that no matter who drove, they would always be at least a little drunk. I forget how many hours into the drive it was, but apparently I had passed out in the passenger seat. Seamus was shaking me and telling me I had to drive. I really didn't want to get up, and I tried to stay in my dream, but it evaporated, and soon I couldn't even remember what it was about. I looked out the window, and I saw we were parked by a road sign for Burma Shave, or was it Tropicana Orange Juice? It was an advertising sign, maybe some kind of cola, I forget. I had to get out of the cab to walk around and get in the driver's side, and when the cooler night air hit me, I realized nature was calling and walked directly over to a patch of trees for a little privacy. Wait, colder? Night air? How could it be night? We left at 9 a.m. and this was a seven-hour drive. I wanted to run back and start interrogating Seamus, but I was sort of committed to the whole nature's call thing, so I had to finish that first before going back to the truck. As I walked toward the trees, I got a weird sense that I was being watched. 
I didn't hear anything strange and I didn't see anything moving, yet I still felt like I was being watched from those woods. So I did the only logical thing. I walked away from there and relieved my suffering on the back of the Burma Shave sign. At least I think it was Burma Shave. This was a long time ago. I couldn't shake the feeling of eyes on my back the entire time. When I got back into the truck, Seamus was snoring in the passenger seat. I shook him, but only sort of got him somewhat awake. He kept yammering that he'd seen leprechauns running back and forth on the road, and that they kept making him get lost. I asked him where we were, and he just giggled kind of crazy, and told me to ask the leprechauns. That creeped me out completely. So I just let him go back to sleep and started driving. Once I started seeing road signs, I'd figure out where we were and where we needed to be. Then I'd have to call the boss and make some excuse for why Seamus got us lost while I slept on the job. That was not going to be a fun phone call, but it wasn't my problem yet, because first I had to figure out where we even were. It was kind of surprising, the total lack of road signs on this stretch of black tar we were driving on. It seemed like we'd been driving 10 or 20 minutes already, and I'd not seen a single sign along the road, not even a milestone or anything. Just a forest as far as the eyes could see on both sides, and the stars and moon joining with our headlights to guide us. Then I saw it, on the right side of the road. It was the Burma Shave sign. I pulled off and parked in front of it, bursting out of the cab and running around to look at it more closely. It sure looked like the same sign. My gaze fell to the road and I saw recent tire marks where we had parked earlier. I raced around to the back of the sign and there it was, still fresh, where I had gone just 10 or 20 minutes earlier. And then that strange feeling returned, the feeling from the woods behind me. I turned suddenly, expecting to see someone there, but all I saw was trees. I was certain I wasn't alone. I looked around at the forest. I saw nothing out of the ordinary. I decided to look lower. What if Seamus really was seeing leprechauns? I saw nothing, but I knew I was still being watched. Insanely, I took one step toward the woods when I heard a low growling. Now we had a standoff. I was afraid to move forward and someone or something was standing just behind those bushes and trees in front of me and it was growling. I had to know what it was. I took another step forward and the growling got louder. <laughs> Leaves and branches moved and swayed, not down low where a short creature would be, and not at eye level to me either. These branches I saw swaying were above my head. If that was a leprechaun coming out of those woods, it was the tallest leprechaun in history. I actually wanted to take another step forward. My curiosity was so great. This time, however, my knees would not cooperate and I found myself sitting down on the grass instead. It didn't matter, as whatever it was in the woods had decided already to come all the way out and I was going to see it in all its glory if I could just keep from blacking out a few moments longer. So I want to point out that when werewolves are in movies, they usually are shown as man-sized and savage, but fast and somewhat thin by monster standards. That is not what emerged from these woods. This thing was a slow-moving, incredibly wide, sickeningly tall, hair-covered monster with a face that was sort of a mix between a man's face and a dog's face. It had two dog ears, but the rest of the face was an abomination. If it wasn't part human, it must have been part ape or chimp, maybe? It sniffed the air, and I wondered for a second if it might be part wild pig. Its nose wasn't exactly a dog nose or a pig nose or a human nose. 
If I had to describe it in a few words, I would say dog-headed ape man, but that head was not actually like any sort of dog I've ever seen or would ever hope to see. I was convinced that this was the end, and little black bugs flew around the edges of my vision. I could tell I was blacking out when suddenly someone was pulling me up from behind. It was Seamus trying to save me. I gasped for air and did my best to help him get me in the cab. Then he ran around to the driver's seat and I could see them. All of them. The huge, slow-moving, incredibly wide and muscular dogman walked slowly slowly toward the car with a dazed robot-like expression on its face. The creature was now surrounded with very short, very pale people. The leprechauns, Seamus informed me. I looked at them and they didn't look like leprechauns to me. They were short, yes, but they had no red beards and they wore no clothes. Or maybe they were all wearing matching leotards? It was hard to say in the dark. Their eyes seemed slanted and dark. They were too large for their faces, but not cartoonishly large like the space aliens they show on TV. None of them had a single hair upon his head, and they all surrounded our truck, watching us. A giant dog man and a bunch of tiny men with dark eyes just surrounding us. Seamus started laughing again. Tears ran down both our faces. I wondered what would happen next, and the dogman suddenly screamed. <laughs> we woke up the next morning, laying on the grass outside the estate of our rich co worker throwing the party. We had each other's socks on, and our shoes were on the wrong feet. Neither of us had any memory of undressing or redressing, and to this day we have no explanation for that. But we made it in time for St. Patrick's Day, and nobody really noticed or cared that we were 12 or 16 hours late with the delivery. Nobody ever asked us anything about it, and we all had a great time that St. Patrick's Day. I got married later that year and quit the beer plant to go work with my father-in-law's company, which is where I worked on through the 1980s. To this day, I avoid upstate New York. Their Bigfoot sightings are legendary, of course. I'm not afraid of that. What I'm afraid of are the magical creatures who seem to be interdimensional and seem to be a huge part of the Dogman mystery. I think that entire area is opening into a kind of reality I never want to encounter ever again. I think that area is a doorway to the reality of the Dogman. <laughs> Peter Bernard, read by P.Q. River. When I was in my early 20s, I got married to a legend tripper. This young woman knew about as much about weird world history as she did about hiking and camping, so we both developed careers that allowed us to work from the road, and off we went on one adventure after another. Little did we know that our light-hearted curiosity would lead to a St. Patrick's Day encounter with an infamous dogman werewolf from Irish history, an encounter that we almost didn't survive. Here's what happened. My wife, let's call her Gwen, decided that since we were in England, long story, we should check out Wales 
In particular, she was interested in the legend of bad King Vereticus. She said her grandmother was Welsh and had told her when she was a kid that King Vereticus had been transformed into a werewolf by St. Patrick as punishment for being a bad dude of one sort or another. Gwen made plans for us to take a tour of Gwittier Castle, then venture south from there to an area in Gwittier Forest Park where we would camp out on the night of St. Patrick's Day and scout around for the werewolf king. Yes, I know. I've got a weird wife, and no, you can't borrow her. So the forest park is hardly a forest park at all by American standards. I find it hard to believe that the large black dogs and black cats that people report in the forests of England could possibly exist here. There's not enough land, and it's also close to civilization. People say Bigfoot lives there in England. Where is there space for such a creature? What does he eat? My wife and I had looked into cryptid reports from England in depth, and I'll be honest, we were just camping there for fun. Neither of us expected to see King Vereticus, the werewolf king, because we knew that it was just a fable. And we knew werewolves don't exist. So that's why, when the full moon cast the silhouette of the dogman on the side of our tent that night, we were almost as shocked as when we heard the creature howl. <coughs> Gwen insisted it had to be a joke, some kids playing a prank on us. I asked her if she was so sure. Why was she whispering? Firearms are not allowed in England, so I knew that if this were a real creature, we were in bad shape. I made a mental note that if we survived this, we would only camp in areas where I could properly protect myself. There was nothing we could do except quietly put our boots on and get ready to bolt out of there the first time it seemed safe. It felt like we were sitting there for hours, but it was probably just a few minutes. We hadn't heard whoever it was walking or howling for a while, so we both agreed that it was time to make a run for the car park and get out of there. My wife had decided this was a lunatic celebrating King Vereticus's memory by acting like a jerk ass. She warned me that this guy might be dangerous. He might really think he's a monster. I thanked her for the warning. So we agreed on the path we would take, breaking right immediately upon leaving the tent, running down the dirt path to the open field. From then on, we should be safe, unless whoever it was really wanted to attack us out in the open. After all, if nobody was around, then out in the open would be as private a place to victimize us as any other. Plus, we'd have to pace ourselves. It took 15 or 20 minutes to reach this spot, and we were not going to be able to do that all in one sprint. Bam! We exited the tent like a trained SWAT team, and bam, we weren't 50 or 60 feet from the tent when we saw it, standing there, directly in the middle of the path, in front of us, blocking our way. It was not a kid. Gwen started crying to my side as she realized that. It was an immense monster. But it was not a Bigfoot or Sasquatch kind of a monster, no. It was a monster like a werewolf. It was bad King Vereticus and he looked hungry. This thing had to be 12 feet tall. It was ridiculous. When it screamed, we just fell back on our butts like something from a slapstick comedy. This was not how I wanted to go. I wanted a serious, dramatic, sad exit. I didn't want to be the butt of a dogman joke. And then? Then? nothing. As in, the dogman disappeared. It didn't blink out. It sort of disintegrated into the air. Or a good word might be to say it looked like it was dissolved into the air itself. Was it really gone? Had it just become invisible? We didn't stick around to find out. The only thing I know for sure is that Unless this was some pen and teller level magician doing an act in the middle of the forest, we weren't being pranked. Occam's razor would point to this being an encounter with some sort of real, or at least supernatural entity. It seemed to be physically there, then it dissolved into the air, like powdered sugar and water. 
We both are still convinced to this day that what we saw had to do with King Vereticus and St. Patrick turning him into an enchanted wolf. My advice to you, if you're looking to camp in Gwittier Castle, would be this. Don't camp there on St. Patrick's Day. Or if you do, bring some extra food for the resident dog man. <laughs> Then give this a look It'll give you more fright Right Scary stories Coloring book Werewolf coloring book And just to make your mind explode It's a digital download All it costs is 209 And then you will be feeling fine Coloring monsters today, hey, it's a coloring book, hooray, okay. Link is in the description. St. Patrick's Day Dogman in the Wolf Road Woods. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I once saw a dogman, but because it happened on the night of St. Patrick's Day, Nobody believes that I really saw it. I think my sighting classifies as a classic cryptid encounter, but everyone else wants to file it under pink elephants. If you have trouble getting anyone to believe you about your dogman or cryptid experiences, try telling them the incident took place on St. Patrick's Day, and you'll find that even some cryptid sympathetic people will roll their eyes at your narrative. My experience took place in a suburb of Chicago in Illinois. I know that you don't get too many dogman stories from Illinois, but I bet that the creatures migrate through this state. In fact, I know they have to because of my sighting. It technically happened in a place called Willow Springs, Illinois. But if you look at that on a map, you'll notice that it's centrally located between Michigan, Indiana, and Wisconsin. And those places are known for dogman sightings. Well, Michigan and Wisconsin at least. So, it doesn't seem so strange to me that a predator known to live in those two states might sometimes stroll through the state in between them. Now, this past year and the year before it were strange ones. At least, I hope we never see their likes again. I lost so many people I thought were friends as they changed before my eyes into humorless, mean-spirited old people long before their years. It reached the point where the only people I wanted to spend St. Patrick's Day with were all either moved away or passed away. So I went a bit of bar hopping, not too much mind you, as not every bar would even allow me in due to some draconian new law which I expect to be repealed soon. Any law which prevents an Irishman from getting soused on this most holy of days is clearly an unjust law. That's not to say I did get drunk, because I didn't. I'm just saying I could've if I wanted to, because it was my God-given American right, as an Irishman, to do so. But I admit I did have a wee taste of heaven here and there as I visited these fine establishments. Now, somehow, I wandered out of the town proper to go wander in the greenery of nature. Of course, there wasn't really much green out there, since spring hadn't really kicked in yet. Plus, it was far colder than I had expected it to be. But still, I found myself walking down Wolf Road in the woods, not heading anywhere in particular, just to enjoy the night and my memories of back when we were all still allowed to laugh and joke around with each other. St. Patrick's is a night for free spirits, and it didn't seem a mere coincidence to me that I was spending this one alone. And then suddenly, I was no longer alone. A large, dark figure walked out of the woods, taking long, slow steps. He appeared to be dragging something behind him. I waved and said hello, and the figure stopped moving entirely, freezing into place, staring back at me. In a mellow and friendly mood, I continued to approach until I was close enough that I could make out the scene more clearly. That fellow 
was dragging a deer behind him, which meant he was much larger than I had at first figured. The deer wasn't moving, so I figured he must have been asleep. Maybe the large man was moving the deer to a more comfortable place to sleep. I didn't even know deer existed in the area. Maybe they aren't supposed to. Maybe this man was relocating the deer to a better habitat. That seemed a considerate thing to do, and I intended to say something to that effect to the man when he suddenly issued a sort of a shout in my direction that felt like a slap on the cheek a little bit. This person seemed inarticulate. Could they be insane or dangerous? I looked a little more closely and the fellow had the strangest face I've ever seen. It really took me some time staring before I could even understand what I was looking at. I'm 99% sure that was not a human being. Possibly it may once have been, but when I was looking at it, most, if not all, of the humanity was absent. Possibly it was a werewolf because its head did look oddly canine, and it was entirely covered in thick dog fur not wearing any clothing at all. I remember thinking that he should at least be wearing a green hat, considering what day it was, but then I banished the thought as frivolous. This shouting, angry-looking, dog-headed fellow was much larger than I was, and he seemed to be growing increasingly belligerent toward me. I heard a low growling, then I realized... I was the one the wolf-headed beast man was growling at. I think this was when I rubbed my bleary eyes and took a good long look at this guy. He was tall, taller than I am by a head and a half. His fur was a dark kind of reddish brown, and he had a lot of it everywhere. Well, not on the palms of his strange-looking hands. They looked like dog paw versions of human hands. The backs were covered in fur, and the ends of each of the fingers had long, sharp claws protruding from them. Not too different from bear claws, or those of a kangaroo, I suppose. It also reminded me of a kangaroo or bear in the way it stood up on its hind legs the way it did. Those were not bear legs, or kangaroo legs that it stood on, though. They looked more like the legs of Satan himself, I realized and I began to shudder all over. Was I being visited by the devil himself? And on such a holy day, whether that creature be the devil or just something evil, in either case, I had happened upon him by accident. Now that we were staring at each other, I realized I had to undo what I had done. I had to make it so that this never happened, or the closest thing to that. With this great beast staring at me, his wild eyes glowing in the darkness, I was going to have to be the one to back off. The dog man was afraid to move, and he seemed even more afraid of me moving. I got the impression that he would prefer not to fight, but that he would be willing to. I was going to have to be the bigger of the two of us. I was going to have to give ground to him. I backed up a step, then another. I noticed the creature's eyes widening, then squinting down at me. I had to be careful not to act too submissive, or he might start to perceive me as potential prey. I needed him to see me as another carnivore or omnivore, but one willing to give him the right of way during this accidental encounter. I aimed to allow him a face-saving way to avoid actual physical fighting. Neither of us wanted a fight, so why did it seem so inevitable? That was a question I had asked myself a lot of times in the past five years or so about nearly everyone I knew. Now it was becoming a matter of life or death. If I fought this particular opponent, I might not live to tell the tale. So I backed up another step, and then I waited to see what would happen. I still had the undivided attention of the huge dog beast, but 
He wasn't growling quite as loudly as he had been earlier. Oh man, I wanted to turn and run so badly. I wanted to scream like a little baby and run home to Mama. But my mother, God rest her soul, left us years earlier. There was nothing I could do except be a man about it. Either I would be able to back away, or this creature was going to painfully terminate my existence. If I wanted to live, I had to keep this slow and nerve-wracking process going. I had to just keep backing up, one step at a time. There was a moment where the dinosaur dog seemed to have finally understood my commitment to avoiding conflict, and he let out a long breath, almost like a sigh. I felt like laughing inside, but I knew this ordeal was not yet over. The immense wolf man turned away from me finally and returned to dragging his heavy load, following the path he was on, into the woods to my left and out of my sight. As for me, I turned and ran like a weeping child. You would have thought something terrible happened, the way I was uncontrollably bawling. It was an embarrassing, shameful display. I couldn't stop my eyes from tearing up, and so I just went home to be pathetic in private, where nobody had to know about it. So I went home, and I had a quick slug of Irish whiskey to steady my nerves and relax me enough that I could get to sleep. The next day, as you can imagine, nobody I knew believed my story. Nobody even wanted to hear it, and yet I don't have a lying hair on my head, and this story is as true as my mother was sweet. So that's the way it went down. And for those of you who think I played it poorly, please tell me what you would have done if you found yourself confronted by St. Patrick's Dogman in the Wolf Road Woods. First of all, happy St. Patrick's Day, everybody. And second of all, I'm gonna bust a rhyme. Blue Cruise is all the news. Hey, all of you, please thank Blue Cruise. Yes, please thank Blue Cruise for making this episode possible. In exchange, we share with them secret, uncensored dogman stories far too wild to run on this channel. But don't take my word for it. Here is international TV spokesmongrel Henry Lee Dogman to fill in the rest of the deeds. Hank. Thanks for watching till the end. If you liked what you saw, please consider clicking like on the video or sharing it with your friends and family that you think might also be interested. If you would like to see more of our work, please consider subscribing and hitting that bell icon next to the subscribe button so that YouTube will alert you when we put out a new video. To become a channel member and gain access to our special perks, you can click that join link under each of our videos. Another option is to join our PayPal Subscribers Club at PeterBernard.com. You can join for as little as 99 cents on YouTube or a buck fifty at PeterBernard.com, and that gains you access to our weekly secret uncensored episodes. If you'd like to see our 21 hours of archives of uncensored Dogman stories, then please join at the $3 level or above. To get to watch our shows in advance of the public, please join at our $10 level that gets you all the perks. If you join our channel memberships, you need to check our community page here on YouTube in order to get the links to the secret videos and other perks. If you're in the PayPal Subscribers Club, Peter will email you all the news and links himself. Once joining the PayPal Club, which is Peter's homemade club, please give him a chance to see that you've joined and to compose you a personal welcome email as none of that is automated. But whichever you join, We'll name you an executive producer for the next available episode. Do you have a scary experience that you'd like to share with us? You can email us at scarystoriesnyc at gmail.com or call our Scary Stories voicemail hotline at 804 Lascary. That's 804 537 2279. It's a Google voicemail box, so that means it keeps cutting off after every three minutes. If your story is longer than that, please keep calling back and we can piece it together on our end. Good night and have a scary tomorrow.
come back for more scary stories.